Earlier, I was listening to a podcast where the guest was Rudyard Lynch. He's the creator behind What If Old Hist. And he was making an assertion that uh, the right currently has trouble staying together because throughout its branches in the world, the only thing it has in common is its opposition to the left. And because of this, iterations of uh, political action on the right don't survive. They don't stay together, they break up, or they get destroyed. They don't have something to bind them. This is something that in electoral politics is very common for the left. I've always jotted this down to it being a matter of progress versus conservation. It's easier to say no to something than to say yes and this is how and have people agree on it. That seems a bit simplistic. I think it's a bit more complicated than that. But it got me thinking about, got me thinking on the lines of an article I'd written a bit over a year ago. I'll link it below. It's a very short one. It's three sentences, actually. I'll read it out first, and then we can break it down together. The title is Liberty in the Network Era, which is a term I like for describing the current era of politics and progress and technology that we live in. Ancient liberty is collective sovereignty. Modern liberty is freedom from arbitrary authority. Liberty in the network era is resilient community. Now let's break those three down. The first two are very much just a summary of a work of political theory written by a Frenchman called Benjamin Constant. And Benjamin Constant was a theorist, was a politician, and a writer uh, just after the French Revolution. So this is 1817, 1818, I think. The paper would be the modern term that I take this from. He makes an assertion that the reason that the chaos of the French Revolution occurred is because it was people wanting to impose ancient liberty, so the desires of ancients, on a modern condition. So there are desires that are appropriate for political conditions, or uh, not necessarily political, but social conditions, but political as well. So just to break down again the sentences, ancient liberty is collective sovereignty. When he refers to ancient, he really means the Greek city-states, and by collective sovereignty he means that in a Greek city-state, the citizen is sovereign in the public sphere. He has the power to vote. I say he because in these cases there were he's. He has the power to vote, uh, the power to take action in this uh, close-knit community, uh, and is considered foundational to the order. A, a, a city-state is a republican in the f etymological sense, uh, res publica, the public thing. On the flip side, this citizen, this ancient citizen, uh, who is, has liberty of their own kind, is completely subject to the state in the private realm. They can be observed, they can be imprisoned, they can be subject to laws with no protections, because everything is for the public thing, for the public good. What is it? Uh, Salus populi suprema lex. The public health is the supreme law, the greater good. So, modern liberty is freedom from arbitrary authority. You might be more familiar with this assertion of, of liberty. It's the one that the founding fathers of the United States of America uh, asserted when they said, give me liberty or give me death. It's the assertion that in the modern condition, in the modern states with defined borders and large territories and, importantly, capitalism, commerce, as constant referred to it, exists. So the ability to make money, to accrue wealth, is suddenly the most important thing in a person's life, in a citizen's life. And doing so becomes more important than anything else. 
And so liberty for this modern man is freedom from authority that arbitrarily prevents him from pursuing that. This is actually um, Constant's assertion is that this is why representative democracy is so good. You elect someone to do the work for you while you can be busy making money. You check on them every once in a while to make sure they're doing a good job. You know, you elect them, you unelect them. But you go to your thing, which is to make money. Whereas in the, for the ancients, the most important thing was running a proper city-state. That was more important for the individual than making money. Now, the third sentence in this, and this is where my assertions come in, is that liberty in the network era, the era of today where networks are the foundational unit of how societies or how individuals in society succeed, is resilient community. Oh, another way of playing around with the concept of liberty I had is that liberty is whatever's lacking in a time. So for the ancients, what was lacking in the in a world lacking states, lacking borders, lacking uh, standing armies, was collective sovereignty, was the ability to, as a group, govern yourself. For the modern man, what they were lacking was freedom to pursue commerce, freedom from this arbitrary authority. This was a time in Europe of absolute monarchs. My assertion is that today, what's lacking is resilient community. We get back to what I was mentioning earlier. The one feature that's true, one of the features that is true both online and the internet in the political environment of the digital age and the physical environment tied to that digital environment is that community is no longer resilient. The communities that we exist in have no mechanism for forgiveness, for reintegration, for addition of new members and for flexibility in changing itself to circumstance. I believe that in the same way that applying the desires of ancients to the condition of the modern man that Constant blamed for the, French, the chaos of the French Revolution, I think that seeking, believing that what we most want to pursue now is wealth ac uh, accumulation, accruement of money, is the desire of moderns in a network age, in the conditions of the network era. Because I think what we need now most of all is resilient community. And that actually is where the political innovations will arrive at. Whoever can provide resilient community to its members will be protected, will be successful as an organizing force, as a mobilizing unit. I think actually this can partly explain from this lens. You can explain why movements on the left have devolved down to base characteristics. And what I mean by that is that movements on the left find themselves forming community around unchangeable realities, or at least what they seem, what they think to be unchangeable realities. So sex, sexual preferences, race. These are things that we perceive as unshakable, and at least we perceive to be fairly inclusive and exclusive. So you're, you're either of or not, and so that's easy to make a group out of. And I think the fact that that is as prevalent as it is, is a sign of how difficult it is to make community otherwise. We have lost the ability to make community out of softer tech and we have revolved back to hard tech to establish that. The great question, of course, having said that all successful political projects will deliver this, is how do you deliver resilient community? And I think the way to look at this is to look at hard power and soft power. And so the absence of resilient community is because the power lies in people willing to exclude you and not re-include you. So there is an element of the ancients here where you want to be collectively sovereign or you want to be assured that your exclusion does not come arbitrarily. See that there's through lines through these three stages of liberty. So power is a hard necessity always. So you want 
and I think this is where the internet comes into play, you can build communities where there is no external manager that can exclude you at a whim or at a choice of uh, heresy. The one that's more interesting is the soft power, is the soft tech that can make a resilient community. And here is what I'm essentially speaking about is culture. What sort of culture, what sort of shared values, the lacking shared values that we were talking about earlier, the right lacking, support resilient community, integrate those who, are the, who, who have been excluded previously, or give room for forgiveness, or give... I don't know, give vision to those that would otherwise be disincentivized or alienated. This is almost a practical political matter. If you can mobilize people to be part of your group and act for the group, you have power. Culture in that sense feeds hard, like soft power feeds hard power. Hard, soft tech feeds hard tech, but you need the you need the strings to be controlled by your own people you can't have external you can't this is why it's so difficult to build communities online is because the platforms where you could do so are more often than not captured they're fiefs they're fiefdoms controlled by some absolute prince and once you get to, once you build the community in turn within that fief that, you know, has mobilizing power, has the ability to change things, you get deplatformed. Because it's a threat to the, it is, it is almost an ecosystem threat. It is like a virus in a, in a, in a body. There's some reflections on that. I will link that three sentence article below. I'd be interested in your thoughts. Thank you for listening.